30 seconds in and the live stream hasn't started i'll freak out in 30 more seconds <laughs> Let me make sure I can hear myself and the audio is right. Awesome. I can hear myself without messing up. Perfect. Uh, this is great. Welcome back to another episode of how many Kaggle tabs is enough. Uh, about this much. If you can count all of these, this right, this amount is enough. Uh, I'm just kidding. Welcome back everyone to the study group. In this study group, we go through top Kaggle solutions and try to understand the winning source behind them. Uh, today I'm going through the... Sumit says, hey, hey, Sumit, with the Dota character. I remember your character now. Uh, in this uh, week, I want to say, in today's live stream, I'll be going through the top uh, solutions of the TensorFlow Great Barrier Reef competition. It's called TensorFlow in the title because I think there were some special TensorFlow prizes. Yes. So if you had some special... Uh, if you completed some special criterion with TensorFlow, there was a separate prize for that. Quite a few of the top winning teams actually ended up using PyTorch, uh, which is quite ironic. So we'll still go through all the top solutions. What I'll try to do is I try to explain some ground basics and then we try to understand all of the top solutions. So like the first half goes into explaining some key bits around this competition. Like I'll spend some time telling you what YOLOX is, spend some time telling you what FCO is. FCOS is and a few more things and then we'll go towards understanding a few fine nuances of the competition. So that's the agenda for today. Uh, Rishabh says, I'm trying to figure out who's he saying hello to. Uh, hey Rishabh and hey Korean. Great to see you all. Korean, it's been a while. We've I have not seen you in a long time. Uh, just two quick announcements everyone. I'm starting a study group on this book. Uh, I've been mentioning it for a while, but uh, Lewis, I'm trying to get my finger at it. Lewis Tunstall will be joining the first uh, kickoff. He's been kind enough to agree to that. And this will happen in the week of Feb 6th. So I just saw his email and uh, he kindly agreed to joining the study group. So with one of the authors will be kicking that off. And um, one more announcement. So I wanted to do something for the NK special uh, live stream. I'll be interviewing all of the quadruple grandmasters in the special live stream. That'll happen sometime in Feb, but uh, just wanted to tease that, just wanted to announce that all of the quadruple grandmasters will, they've kindly agreed to join a panel and that'll be live streamed in a few weeks. So just keep an eye out for that. All right, now let's um, talk about this competition and start understanding what this is about. So in the title, it says, help protect the Great Barrier Reef. And the mission is to detect crown of thorns starfish. You will see a lot of places where COTS is mentioned. So COTS stands for uh, this particular starfish. And we'll see why is this uh, dramatic or why is this important in underwater image data. So when I tweeted out about this competition, I said it's quite a challenging problem for object detection because if you end up looking through the data, this video explains you the problem. But if you look through the data, you'll see that the images or the starfishes are really small. And you'll see that the underwater aspect of the videos make it even harder to detect all of them. So the goal is to accurately identify starfish in real time by building an object detection model trained on underwater video of coral reefs. Uh, the reason for that is this particular type of starfish, cots, has started eating uh, or disbalancing the barrier reef population. So helping detect this is actually a real world uh, use case and will actually impact the real world. So this is quite an interesting problem in that, that regard. The evaluation of this was F2 score. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with this, you can read through it, but I assume everyone is familiar with it. So I'll be skipping through that. And what I'd like to do is I'll probably start by explaining some basics around the competition. So what I'll do is I'll uh, give a refresher of object de detection once again, and I will use hydrogen torch, which team hydrogen who had finished third in this competition have been creating. So they've added a lot of their efforts to this tool and I'll be demoing that or I'll be reminding you all of what object detection is through that. Here, yeah, Kaush, thanks for joining. So um, let me find the right tab. And I have already launched the, tab, uh, launched the application here. This is an application on um, 
H2 is hybrid cloud, uh, which is giving me an error right now. Not the best time. Hmm. Let me see if I can figure this out. Otherwise, I'll come back to this in a while. All right, that's not ideal. So what I'll do is I'll probably come back to this later. But what I wanted to show you was how you can uh, do object detection in, first of all, hydrogen torch. And what does it look like? The different things you can mess around with. I had trained a bunch of models, but I just wanted to remind you all of the baselines that exist or the backbones that exist and how uh, you can familiarize yourself with it through this tool. Let me see if the app launches. If it doesn't, I'll probably come back to this in a while. This is the first time I'm seeing this issue, so that's interesting. Um, and that's my point to prove that this is indeed a live demo. Let's see if we can get this up this time. I think it has launched. If this takes more than 30 seconds, I'll uh, skip and come back to it later. I don't want to keep you all waiting. All right, uh, sounds, seems like there's some issue right now. So um, I'll come back to it later. Someone is asking, can you also include some sessions for responsible AI? I had actually just done a panel on it uh, last weekend. So not weekend, a few days ago. Let me point you to that. So give me one second. Sorry about that, everyone. There seems to be some issue, but I just wanted to do a quick refresher for you all on object detection. I'll come back to it later. Uh, Shavan says, hello. Hey, Shavan. Shavan has been building an uh, insanely overpowered GPU rig. And we've been talking about it, so I'm, I'm not sure what, what's going on there. Uh, for Akash, you were asking about a responsible AI resource. This is the one I wanted to point you towards. So you can go to h 2 ais channel, and I'd actually hosted um, four amazing people who've been leading this effort at h 2 Parul, Erin, and Kim. Uh, you can watch this interview, learn a lot about the topic if you're interested. So um, skipping the first part where I intended to remind you all of object detection, I'll start by giving some ground basics. So inside of this uh, competition, you were supposed to detect cots or this crown of thorn starfishes. And for that, you were provided three videos. Now let me quickly accept these terms. You have to accept the rules and then only you can show the data. That's that's how Kaggle goes. But inside of trained images, you can see that there are three different videos which have images inside of it. So once this loads up, as you can see, uh, identifying anything inside of it is quite hard. And to me, like all of these things look the exact same. So it just looks like trees everywhere to me. But uh, we'll start going through some top uh, kernels and we'll see that it, some starfish actually exist inside of this video. And throughout these three videos, you've been provided with just these underwater uh, images from the videos. So the tool I was about to show you, Hydrogen Torch, also allows you to work with these images. You'll just have to uh, basically create a video into images using a straightforward CV2 script, and then you can load in videos as well. But uh, this is the kind of data you were working with. So you were provided all of these high resolution video files. And if you've worked with object detection, you'll know that it's quite memory hungry. So uh, working with video files makes it even harder in the sense that you have to also figure out if you need to uh, connect the frame by frame information. And some, I, I think it was the second team had also done this intelligent rule where if you go between two frames, so let's say we're looking at one six and one seven, and let's say a square or the identified box moves just, moves by just a few pixels. So let's say it was right here. And then in the next uh, frame, it's just moved a bit. So it's moved from here to here, like let's say by two or three pixels. If that happens, you will boost the models confidence for that. So you can be sure that, hey, if I'm, let's let's say watching this video and if I go back and try to move these monitors and in the next frame, they just move by a little, I'm not flash, I won't run <laughs> as fast, but if they just move by a frame, you can boost the confidence for the model 
and that's a post processing trick that we'll see one of the teams had used so i have to also think about how to factor in the time um nature of this video in the sense that all of these images are connected so this is the data you working with and you have to work with an api so the hidden test set will be served with an api to ensure you evaluate the images in the same order so uh, kaggle had taken care that you can't you can't do some uh, interesting hacking around it so all of that is taken care of this was a challenge let's take a look at some kernels to understand uh, a few things so i have the discussions open first let me find the kernels here we are so this will help us understand what all baselines were being shared also had shared this yolo v5 uh, training baseline and yolo v5 is one of the most popular object detection uh, frameworks if i may and it's pretty straightforward to work with it there's only a few fine tricks you need to work with so he's shown here how you can load the data up and how you can effectively convert it from coco into yolo format so the data is provided to you in coco format and then you need to export your labels to yolo format he showed everyone how to do that he showed everyone how to uh, create a baseline and then he had also shared a inference kernel in this competition so naturally everyone started with yolo v5 and everyone progressed through that then uh, remek had shared a yolo x training pipeline so in very few words what's the main difference between yolo x and yolo v5 yolo x let's let's look here on the right hand side yolo x is a high performance anchor free yolo what does anchor free here mean inside of uh, yolo v5 or other yolo algorithms it expects some reference boxes which are known as anchors and it usually predicts around them if you don't know those you can read through the paper it's straightforward to understand or if you like check out any any overview blog post they'll they'll give you a nice high level understanding but um the idea is you have these anchor boxes let's say you're trying to identify my face there would be some anchor boxes that would help set the guide so they would be around here and maybe here this particular variation of yolo and we can see the open source repo right here is an anchor free version of it so that's all the gist you need to see and then you can read through the paper if you want there was another technique used by a few of the top teams so this is fcos and this is actually exists inside hydrogen torch uh, which i was going to show and i'll i'll try to show it later if i can this stands for fully convolutional one stage object detection just to read through the abstract here real quick let me zoom in a bit a little more i hope this uh, text size is okay for everyone so they say uh, they propose a fully convolutional one stage object de object detector scos to solve object detection in a per pixel prediction fashion so they are solving object detection in a per pixel prediction fashion fashion <laughs> analogous to semantic segmentation they say almost all of these sota detectors uh, rely on predefined anchor boxes what we had just discussed their approach is anchor free as well as proposal free and by eliminating this need it completely avoids the complicated computation related to anchor boxes so you can if you read through if you're not familiar with anchor boxes you can read through it you'll understand that but uh, that's on fine nuance that exists hello tarun tarun says hey and um let's see what else the only post processing that happens here is non maximum suppression so if you're not familiar with nms usually you have you can see a lot of false predictions when you're running object detection algorithms and you can see a lot of false uh, bounding boxes what nms does is it tweaks the accuracy or it's you can think of it like a post processing technique although it's not really that because it's a part of the algorithm what you do is you look at the boxes and then based on the how confident the model is you filter them out so you say okay i i really don't care about the predictions where it thinks that hey uh, this is 
30 percent accurate or 40 percent i only care about 70 percent 80 percent or stuff like that we'll see in the first position solution that they had actually also uh changed this trick or they changed how the nms uh post processing is happening so it's it's still quite relevant in that way so that is fcos and uh, you can read through yolo access documentation so it's not just a repository it's a complete package And here's the paper for that. So the paper is linked in the GitHub repo. I'm not sharing those links because these tend to be long. And if I post them on the screen, it'll be hard. If you just look up YOLOX, it should take you to this. If you look up FCOS object detection, it should take you to the paper. There was one more uh, thing that was used fairly commonly. So CenterNet, not fairly commonly, it appeared twice in the top solutions. So CenterNet, which is object detection using center point detection. And let's see what the paper says. So the paper is called Objects as Points. Detection identifies objects as axis aligned boxes in an image. And most of the object detection uh, algorithms create a large number of object locations and classify each. So they say this is like uh, not the most optimum way of applying your resources or it, it's like computationally heavy. In this paper, they say they aim uh, to, they model an object as a single point, the center point of its bounding box. And their detector, here's a key part. So their detector uses key point estimation to find center points and regresses to all other object properties. Center net is an end-to-end -end differential, differentiable, simpler, faster, and more accurate bounding box detector this really isn't true because i don't know when this paper came out 2019 there's been like uh what uh, efficient debt all sorts of interesting algorithms so this is not really true the key thing uh to remember here is this uses key point estimators and uh it doesn't work like calculating axis aligned boxes instead it just calculates the center of uh the bounding boxes so that is center net and i think two teams had used this so that's one thing to remember. Just to recap, YOLO EX um, is one of the algorithms which is anchor free. FCOS is another, if I may, anchor free um, method. And then you have Centernet, which works through key point uh, detection. Shall I saying thank you for such a wonderful channel? Thanks for such a wonderful comment. Um, hey, Aditya and Nishche. Nishche, what? What's going on in RSNA? Where are you on the leaderboard? I'm contemplating if I should share uh, the jacket story. Let's see. I don't know. Usually he just drops in, shares a message and runs off. So let's see if he replies. Cool. Uh, so that's the reference for the top solutions and he's saying nice hoodie can I have it so I'll share the story because he's messing with me in uh Kaggle days Barcelona he was trying he was trying to fit this uh hoodie or he was trying to wear the grandmaster hoodie and I said no it won't fit you and I sort of snatched it from him just to tease him uh he's been very upset with me since so I don't know <laughs> you need the solo world to make it fit Nishche all right enough messing with Nishche so that's the tricks that the top teams have used. Let's take a look at this discussion. So Sheep, whose team had finished uh, first on this competition, and his name is Sheep. I, Kaggle username is Sheep. I don't know his real name, his or her. He had shared this resource. YOLO V5 higher resolution is all you need. And if you look at the kernel, it's really straightforward. All he has done is just use the standard YOLO uh, model through their through the torch model hub. So he's just done this and he set the con confidence to 0 0.01 loaded up. That's that's the end of this notebook and it has 700 folks, which is a really high number. Relatively speaking, right? Compared to any number of folks. Shiva is talking to Nishche, so I let them talk. And 
we have another computer vision expert in the chat shout out to ayush man all right so that shared this kernel sheep and it got a lot of folks because what he had shown in this kernel was if you use or if you modify some hyperparameters and use a really high resolution with yolo v5 you can get a really high score so he had boosted the score enormously and this was a really popular discussion as well as you can see not sometimes even the gold discussions don't get this many number of upvotes so you can imagine that this was quite an interesting pointer to everyone which pointed everyone to using high resolution images for these models and some people had been discussing best single model cvlv so you can see that people are using faster rcnn uh i think the seventh place position actually ended up using cascade rcnn and here someone is saying yolo v5 is not all you need uh, then you can see later on someone had shared that yolo v5 was actually all you needed Ashman and Nishchi are rolling each other, so I'll ignore their chat for now. And you can see that people are using either YOLO V5 or faster RCNN. I'm not seeing any other model so far. And their CV score was about 0.72, LB was 0.642. That was another challenge in this competition because you just had three videos, right? So you just had those three videos to train with. Setting up your uh, CV was also a challenge, and the first position team was actually kind of trolling in that way. Uh, this is how everyone actually really uh, started identifying Chishin because a day before the competition, he had shared that hey, he's looking forward to learning from everyone, and then their team jumped up by one twenty positions. So we'll just see how they had set up the CV, but you can imagine setting up the CV was quite hard. Uh, this is the discussion I wanted to point out. So this is just one day before they had actually won the competition, and there was one discussion I wanted to point out, which uh, suggested that you should be careful when splitting your model here because this these images are a part of a video, right? So let's say if you randomly split, let's say. and you have the first frame in your training data set so let's say this is a demo of a technique but let's say this image appears in one frame of training and the next frame just after this from the video appears in the test set which is like fairly possible to happen right so like if you randomly split and these are connected frames the next frame could end up in the test set that's that's leakage because you already have that info trained right in the model so you have to be very careful when doing this and what i think the top team had done they had split based on the video id so the three different videos had become three different folds essentially so this was another technique that was fairly popular fast underwater image enhancement so you can see that there are some general uh, augmentations you can apply to underwater videos and photos to change the image slightly uh, someone had shared all of these gans that you can apply best fitting he had finished fifth and he had used gans to augment the images although he claimed that they didn't really help so it's uh, open to debate but you can see that one possible technique was using gans to augment the images so uh, somusan had shared some more image uh, augmentation techniques so some of them are right here we can read through this CLAHE stands for contrast limited adaptive histogram equalization this is from 1994 and this was used a lot throughout the competition so i'm not just like reading random gibberish this was used a lot uh, the other ones didn't appear so much but you can see that these are like traditional pre processing techniques and if you look, if you apply all of these he says he started with CLAHE and you can see that the image becomes slightly better or slightly more visible to the human eye now what really matters is how well can your model identify things inside an image sometimes the things you're trying to segment or identify or detect 
aren't really visible to the human eye if you look at the cords it's really not visible in this data set but if you pre process well enough and you can see your cv going up you can see your correlated lb score that means that that augmentation is working really well and these are not my words these are words from chishan i had interviewed him about his top solution and he had taught me that so it's worth trying every technique clahe was one of the common ones there was also mosaic and other ones we'll see just in a second nvnn had also shared this paper connected to concealed object detection and uh, heng had pointed out towards using gans for creating star fishes so he had also shown how you can actually do that so he's suggesting you can do something like image in painting and the reason why i'm reading through this is the first or second i think it was a third place had actually done something like this and even best fitting had done something like this so it's worth mixing up different images as you can see there's not a lot of information visible right here right so let's say you're giving the bounding boxes of these star fishes you can cut and paste them in another image and you sort of create these false positives and you can use that for training so that was a technique that our other teams actually ended up using and there was a lot of discussion that the lb wasn't use, uh, useful because there was so much uh, variation there was a lot of concern around that there were a few discussions around that but that's all i wanted to point out so far and let's see if i can also highlight a few more things here so this is a general eda uh, around the data set which i think i'll skip now because i pointed out all of the factors as you can see inside this image it's like to the human eye it's really hard to even know what's what's a starfish right i don't know if it's plotted anywhere but here's an example so you can see after a bit of post processing the starfish have been identified and this is what you're trying to aim for so you need to identify all of these star fishes inside of these images there was also s a h e sahi uh i'm laughing because that's a hindi word it stands for slicing aided hyper inference and it's a vision library for performing large scale object detection so a few of the teams also had used this and this also appears in a few examples i'm skipping through other uh, notebooks because i've already talked about things that were worth mentioning here poison blending comes up here and we'll just see what's happening in poison blending the third team had actually used this so i'll wait for that i think that's about all of the info i wanted to give as a setup chishan had also shared this notebook so if you ever see f2 metric again you can just copy paste from his kernel but for this competition the or the organizers didn't provide the metric implementation most of the times they end up doing that but if you need the metric it's been evaluated it's been uh, shown how to do that here all right so let's take a look at the leaderboard and we can see that chishan is on top his team is on first position and they had jumped by 120 positions i can see chenglu's team on second position chenglu also usually ends up doing really well across different competitions yeah i remember him from ai for code that's how i remember team hydrogen of course is on third position they're always in top 5 and that's why i was i was wanting to showcase hydrogen toss today but i don't think i'll get a chance i see Trushant and Kunhao from H2 as well here. I think this was the competition where Trushant had become a competition master. So what I'm trying to look at here is the score differences. As you can see, the first position had like an insanely large difference. And let's see where the gold ends. So it ends about 0.714. And we already saw that the CV wasn't relating. So 
I'm not sure if that info is really le- relevant, but let's just keep an eye out for the private scores. For our, our purposes, 7 and 5 is the last gold position and 7 6 is the best possible one, although only one team got that. Beluja was also taking part in this competition. Nice. And one more of my colleague from H2. Interesting. I don't think Nishche, you took part in this competition. Did you? He's saying time to build a oxygen team on Kaggle. Yeah, you should do that. Or you all can figure out how to contact each other if you stop spamming my chat. All right, so now we'll get to the meat that we wanted to. The top solution, then I'll start dissecting them. I have just been a little distracted with their spamming in the chat, which I'll keep ignoring for now. <laughs> the first position was Chishan Ha's team. And let's take a look at how they got to that insane score. He says this was very unexpected for them uh, because they didn't have any new thing. They just kept optimizing cross-validation of FT, sorry, F2. <laughs> F2 scores of their pipeline till the end. They designed a two-stage pipeline, object detection followed by rescoring, and then a post-processing method follows. The validation strategy was a three-fold validation split by video ID. So we had looked at the three videos present in the training data, right? And the thing you have to be careful is you don't end up leaking your frames in a validation data set because then your CV will be insanely large and it's not really useful. So what he had done is, or what his team had done was he had separated these three videos into different folds and he had created validation sets for them separately. So there's no leakage in that sense. And for object detection, they had used six YOLO V5 models. Three of these were trained on this image size, 3648. And three were trained on smaller image patches. And they talked about image patches. So we'll just come to that. They cut the original image into many patches, removed boxes near the boundary, and then only trained YOLO V5 on those patches with cords. So what they've done is, let's say you only care about identifying my face. So what they would have done is, let's, let's figure out how to zoom into it. Um, if my face is in just this left part, I think it's left for you, right? So you would just crop into this area or if it's even a smaller one, you would just crop into this area where you care about the object of interest being present and then just train their YOLO V5 models on that particular patch. That modified some hyperparameters. So that's changed the box settings and the IOU threshold. So the IOU threshold was 0.3. And they had used the default augmentations for YOLO V5, added rotation, mix up, and transpose. And they had removed HSV, which slightly makes the image look weird. So if you've seen that, it's just like uh, when you used to have those images that were developed, when you change or when you when they're just being developed, that's that's what HSV does. So they had used some very basic augmentations, if I may. And then after the optimization was done, they trained the final models with all the data. So they would have taken the best models from each folder and trained it on the entire data. All models are inferred using the same image size as training. And then these six were ensembled. So I actually interviewed Chishin after, afterwards and they had used WBF when ensembling these or in some cases, he had also simply just taken the average of the predictions. So it was a mix of both. And I, I don't think I got the clarity on where what was used. But either WBF or just averaging the predictions. For rescoring, it had cropped out all predicted boxes into squares where confidence was more than, this would be 1%, right? Yes. So they had cropped out all the boxes where confidence was more than 1%. And the side length of the square, square is calculated like so. 
it's then extended by 20%. So they're basically trying to like pull out interesting segments from the image. And then they calculate the IOU as the maximum of each predicted boxes and ground truth boxes of this image. Classification target of each crop box is like so. So are you greater than 30, 40%, 50%, 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, and 0.9? Simply put, the IOU is divided into seven bins. So they had created seven bins for IOU and predicted them like so. During inference, they average seven bin outputs as classification score. So what they have done, if you pay attention here, is they've pulled out the fishes of interest <laughs> or the object of interest. Let's say if you just want to classify my face, you would probably pay attention on this area and then extend it a bit. So it would crop into this. And then essentially by using the bins in IOU, they've converted this into a classification problem. And this is like a second stage trick that they're doing. Then they'd use BCE laws to train those crop boxes on the following sizes. They'd set a very high dropout rate, which they claim had helped with the performance. The augmentations are also interesting because I've never seen such high rotation being used, but I assume this was a right through experimentation. And after ensembling, their score comes to 0.73. Let's see how they got to 0.76. So they had used some simple post-processing they claim. And they say, if the model has predicted some boxes B at a frame, select the boxes B, which has high confidence. And these boxes are marked as attention area. In the following frames, if the predicted boxes have a confidence more than 0 0.01, and if they are in the attention area, the score is boosted. So to explain simply, like I was trying to tell you earlier, if I just move a monitor in this video, and let's say I'm moving it towards one direction and I'm expected to move it in one direction. If you look at two or three subsequent frames and the monitor is being identified and it's still in like a relative area. So let's say it still exists in some area right here you would boost the score because it's not going to magically disappear. So that's like a very fascinating post-processing technique, right? Because it's like quite obvious, but I don't think any other team has used it. If they did, they didn't mention it, but it's just using like uh, something very obvious. So that's, that's it for the top solution. And this was the first place solution with like an insanely large score. Uh, to summarize, they'd use three fold cross-validation split by video ID. They trained six YOLO V5 models. After training them, they had done a second stage modeling where they converted it into a classification problem. After getting the ensemble score from all of these classification models, they would then do some obvious post-processing. And through that, they got to this insanely large score of 0.76. Sorry about that. Shiva is asking, how can he meet me? You can just reach out to me anywhere on the internet. Let's go through the second place solution. And this is from Cheng Lu's team. He says YOLO V5. He's also open sourced his solution right here. So if you want, you can go through it. There's one single bash script. I was actually looking through it, but there's one single bash script that you can run and you can completely replicate his score. And he says, you'll probably need like a large GPU to score it, but he, they're trained on 3200 image size. If you want, you can like train it on a smaller image size. And if you look inside their training script, you can change the image size very conveniently as well. And it's very well documented code. So you're welcome to read through that. But that's also been open sourced by the second position team. They say their solution is totally based on YOLO V5. And there are three let me zoom in a bit. He says there are three keys of the competition, the CV resolution and luck. So second place had also split by video ID. He says that they saw there is a solid way to split the data set called subsequence, but this was not stable. So they ended up splitting through video ID. 
that used the v5 default augmentations as well and then added mosaic mix up and random rotation i guess it kind of makes sense right like i was curious why a large rotation angle makes sense in this uh, use case but if you like rotate my head right now i'll never stand like this right like my head being in this angle to the ground at least but since this is an underwater video if you like rotate it even by like crazy angles that's still possible right because like i assume these videos are recorded through like a submarine or something like that so maybe like i'm trying to put logic into why like large angles are being used here i've never seen like 45 or even 90 degree for that matter being used in augmentation but i think that that somewhat makes sense right so they say this gives a small boost it's actually a large boost for for a cavel competition for training this a larger model works better and diversity of v5 small medium large nx is not very large so they settled on yolo v5 large six model training images training with images that has ground truth only he says training with 10% background will produce best results from their experiments 0% background produce the best result ashman is saying neural networks <laughs> defy common logic i have to agree with you um so this is another point i wanted to say like one that ashman has already mentioned but again highlighting the same fact that you have to actually experiment that and all of these models or frameworks that have been open sourced are just like on this toy data set right like which is image net coco all those like standard data sets but if you like end up applying them to kaggle data sets or kaggle problems that's where you like actually discover where they behave in different ways so you have to experiment and see and that's where the science and data science comes from they also talk about multi scaling yolo v5 has built in multi scaling switch and from what they know scaling matters a lot especially for anchor based detection method so they are just enabled it they talk about post processing which is focus on tracking instead of using existing tracking methods they use a simple method called attention area which i think is similar to the first place position yes and this sort of makes sense so i would like if i was working on any object detection problem in videos i'd probably use this Sumit is saying it's hit and trial. Yeah, I agree with you. It's hit and trial. And someone is saying Nishchha has a great Kaggle profile. I agree with you. Uh, Nishchha is in what top twenty right now. He's a Kaggle <coughs> master in <laughs> top twenty-five. I think he's the current highest ranked uh, Kaggler from India. And they talk about on thumbling. so the attention trick is similar to first position so i'm just skipping that in ensembling they say after sheep had released the high resolution trick which i talked about so if you use yolo v5 with high resolution it gives you a boost they know that one model inference with different resolutions will have a huge difference and they say model trained with 2400 or 4800 will get the highest lb score and they should be careful because the cv is in true here and they have shared their cv scores so they say all evidence suggests that resolution matters a lot and they were not sure if the private data set has the same score so that made it hard for them and they have shared some more experiments but uh, that's the end of it so i, I assume what helped them was just training on different resolutions to summarize they had also split on video ids they had done a lot of pre processing and they say rotation is key they had also looked into some like things that were obvious and figured out they were not the good default so they ended up changing those and finally they had also used the attention trick that the first team did as well if you want their solution is open source you should check it out it's really high quality code and i'll remember to start it and remember to upload it if i did not i did upload it so that's that's good all right let's continue further
I don't see anything in the chat, so I'll keep going. The third place is Team Hydrogen, and they say their solution is a blend of five different object detection models with tracking for CV. And I think this is like a key signature move of Philip, right? I've seen him do this many times in different competition where he would have like two. CV strategies that he would keep comparing against. Usually you just have one. And by that, I mean, like you have like five folds and you have like these five models that you're training uh, and you keep comparing those. But what Philip often does is he usually like has two different, completely different uh, CV setups. And he's always comparing against those. So one is simple split by video. And the other is making five folds based on subsequences. They were mostly looking at subsequent CV scores, time to time checking video fold performance. This gives us a good correlation. However, it failed for private LV. And they have mentioned uh, their thoughts below. So we'll come to that. Their model is a blend of five different model types. All have been trained on this resolution. Only using images with boxes. And for augmentation, they mention a few obvious ones. Nothing really stands out. They had used a background mix as well. And something similar had used had been used by the fifth position. So let me use, let me showcase this. Third place had used something different. But for simplicity, I'm like trying to just showcase it visually. So let's say you have this fish right inside this image. You would just copy paste this into like another image or another similar image. And that's poison blending. So they've done something similar where they randomly mix an image with boxes with a random image without boxes. This guarantees to not overlap or distort boxes since there are no boxes in the other image, right? But it generalizes better to unseen backgrounds and also randomizes the intensity of objects. Some models benefit from cut and paste augmentation by simply cutting and pasting objects to other frames. They had used CenterNet. I had just showcased this while starting out and that was the reason why I showcased this. The backbone that I used was HRNet here. The object detection task in CenterNet is treated as key point estimation. So they downsampled four times for predicted heat maps. And the final submission included two backbones, the following, that produced similar local performance. The other model was F faster RCNN. And they had changed the backbones uh, to NFNet. They had used four feature layers and 256 FPN out channels. The third model was FCOS, which also I'd shown earlier, so I'll skip that. The second last one was Efficient Debt with the Efficient Debt V2 backbone. And finally, YOLO V5. I'm just skipping over all of these because like some of the obvious things have been shared here. Or uh, if you really like want to read through it, this is like relevant if you're training something similar or just on this competition. I assume if you like take efficient data and train it on another competition, you like have to train it for like a different number of epochs or like figure out different uh, hyperparameters. So it's not worth mentioning it. So anyways, they had used all of these models, Sentinet, Faster RCNN, FCOS, Efficient Data, and YOLO V5. For blending and tracking, they talk about uh, using average WBF blending. For tracking, the issue with adding missing boxes using Kalman filters is quite tricky. So they use tracking in a different way. They use Euclidean distance on center points to find tracks. But they keep the, keep the confidence low for finding more tracks. Then they are setting the confidence of low confidence boxes to the maximum confidence of the track. So to simplify this, uh, you would have the center points of different boxes. And what they're doing here is they're looking at the confidence of those predictions. 
and then using like this fine technique or if i may a post processing to boost or change those confidence with like very obvious logic uh, which is somewhat similar to the one i had shown about moving uh, my monitor in the background that's like a very simplified explanation of all of this they say using all of this boost their score by 0.01 which still is like a large boost they had also used optical flow which is like an open cv algorithm you can read through it i actually used it during my internship and never after that but um that's about it for their post processing i'm just reading through the chat i'll answer your questions just after this then they talk about label tightness and public lb they say for most people uh their public like similar to most people their lb was also lower than cv however they noticed that there was something different because people with higher lb had so much worse cv so they finally tried the higher resolution trick and that boosted their score by quite a bit the working theory that they came around was the higher resolution produces boxes that are more exact around cots and in training labels are very imprecise and inconsistent so they are saying maybe like they are trying to figure out what could be in the test set and they actually visually looked through that and the gist of this is uh, they had tested this theory that maybe the private lb has like very tight um boxes but i think the gist was it wasn't the case so there other i think submission might have been helpful because the private lb was also similar they say uh, they were very confident that it should hold for the whole test set but it did not so you can read through this just to understand it but this was just like some uh, conversation around how tight the boxes are to summarize their uh, solution they had used two cross validation techniques to keep a consistent check against how well their models are uh, correlating and they had used sentinet faster rcn and fcos efficient data and yolo v5 that you blend uh, that blended with wbf and then used a very fine optical flow plus tracking for post processing finally they had taken a look at how tight were the bounding boxes being created and done some post processing around that so this is the third place team hydrogen solution by philip and yawen the fourth place is quite short so let me catch up on the chart do you use any track any tool for tracking experiments i just rely on uh, google sheets right now and if i can keep all the columns populated what is the secret of nishche's uh achievements she was asking and i can like just echo what ayushman said that like any and this is true to any top kagler and even so nishche and even like i would say ayushman as well like both of them are like incredibly hard working people which is true to like any top kagder i know screenshots of training progress is the op method i agree with ayushman <laughs> all right uh, fourth place is very simple since over fitting strategy failed let's talk about what i have done one month ago he had used centernet with deep lab v3 plus architecture and efficient net v2 backbone start from this example in tensorflow so this was i think this was the first team in the top 5 uh, that had used keras i might be wrong about that he had changed the backbone to different efficient net he had changed from b0 to excel change the heat map from 18 the input size or he had changed it to 18 the input size i did a regression head and then trained on 120 1280 by 720 and infringed on 1.4 times of that 
just blending these two he can get a high score and this is really cool to see right like i am sure a few details are missing like what uh, augmentations he had used whatever uh post processing he might have used i don't think there was any but you can see like even just using a very simple example from like literally literally the examples of tensorflow sorry keras just tweaking that a little bit i mean not a little bit i'm sure he done like a fair amount of research when doing this you can get a solo fourth which is quite incredible right and there were some discussions around how he did this and what he had done he says he had trained on crop sizes to full frame randomly and he had used a 2080 ti for this competition i think that was the only trick i wanted to point out that he had also used like a very small gpu but you can see that like even a very simple technique can land you in the top 5 even with a solo gold Let's take a look at the fifth place solution by Best Fitting, and he says uh, his idea was the following: copy chords boxes and paste them into background image, apply blending, several detection methods on different image sizes, and appending boxes to detection results by finding homography matrix. So I'd already shown this image, but let's take another look. the data was relatively small he says i mean like it was so here are like the conflicting arguments right like it was a video with like a large number of images so it's like really hard to train it it takes like one day on a 2080 ti and for the third place you need like a a6000 to replicate it but um it had just three videos so it was like a relatively smaller data set Shawn is asking what best score would someone have if they had used Kaggle resources. I think the seventh place had just used Kaggle resources, so you can get a gold if you just use Kaggle resources. It's hard to say. You can like now if you want to replicate these things, it's like easy to do that with Kaggle resources. But the thing is, like in the heat of a competition, right? Like when you're trying all of these techniques and you don't have these top solutions, how do you do it then, right? It's so like and also like given the thirty hour quota of every month and all those things, how do you do it then? How do you come up with these answers then? That's that's a like that's what differentiates the people who end up in the top solution and how do like they come up with these smart ideas. They say uh, we can benefit with more data since the data set is small and we can generate more starfish and put them in undersea images. So how does he do that? The simplest way is to crop. in train set and paste it to another images but there are two problems the boundary and the color is not real and the chords aren't on reasonable places so if you like look at the image below this doesn't make sense right you wouldn't find a chords there because like the color isn't lining up so how did he solve this problem by using poisson blending and then training a classification model to predict whether it was real or fake so this is like a sort of a fake gan or like a gan alteration he actually even ended up training a gan after this and he says this did not help the score he says it's limited by the count of unique starfish and if you can use more chords downloaded from the internet you could have improved the score other methods such as image harmonization which i have no idea what that means did not help and he quite enjoyed it even despite uh, ended up he ended up spending a lot of time on it so let's take a look at what he did after this he says he had split five folds by sequence and the models used were yolo v5 small 6 medium 6 large 6 x with a large variant yolo r with p6 and hrnet so we've seen all of these earlier except yolo r yolo r was shared in a kernel if i remember correctly by remek so that's where this had come up with can we use image augmentations after splitting data yes you can i don't understand how you cannot 
can you elaborate on what your exact question is you just like apply it when loading the images so what you care about is augmenting the images as you load them into your model and sometimes you end up applying them on the fly most of the times you apply them on the fly in the data loader sumit so, uh, i don't understand in what context are you saying that so you have all of these models that are being used and we've already seen this so i'll skip over the like optimizer scheduler augmentation i had done a panel with philip and team hydrogen and more legends from h2 about like their opinion so these like vary of course based on the competition and also like based on opinions and you can see that these even vary from like model to model so i'm sure like uh, best fitting had some like intuition about where to use what and then like a lot of experiments so that's where you use these for tracking he says if the detection model has found a box in previous frames you can predict the box in the current frame using the following way kalman filter optic flow and homography matrix so we had seen kalman filter and optic flow come up earlier these are somewhat mentioned earlier and the third method is the best for this data set and we can get key point descriptors using these two techniques the tracking pipeline is like follows if there is a box detected in 10 frames earlier then append a box using this matrix method to a frame after that unless there is already a box and if the io is greater than a certain amount repeat this process until the current frame then you end up applying deep sort to get a track and determining a box on a track is by the ratio of model predicted boxes if the ratio is too low it may be a false positive so what you care about is making sure the box exists in the right place in the video or the inside the image so you just essentially what he's doing here is he's he's checking if it's a false positive or not and he's using something known as a homography matrix which i don't know what it is but sounds like after doing that you can figure out uh, the exact predicted location in the subsequent frame and then you do then you compare that against what the model is predicting and if these overlap really well you keep doing that and that's how you come up with the track for ensembling he had used iou as a filter and for the remaining boxes he had used wbf here are the results of his training this is interesting right because this looks like it came out of a paper i was trying to think if this is like a paper he had shared but it's like his tool so i'm curious like what tool is he using or like where is he writing this because i don't know any tool that gives you a check mark like this right does google sheets do that i don't know anyways he shared all of these models and their ensemble scores and that's how he got to the fifth solo gold so to summarize there was this like really cool and like some thoughtful image augmentation and after that some straight forward models and then slightly different tracking method and the two things that stand out are his cv approach uh, and the way he is augmenting or copy pasting these he had also used gan he claims and also the way he tracks these so three things are like very different and you usually find that best fitting solution sometimes are like an interesting read not sometimes all of the time any pre any pre processing or any processing we do after splitting train test may cause overfitting right depends like you have to be careful not to cause any leakage so let's say like uh, there is also test time augmentation right so uh, if you are it's safe to say that you can also rotate like test images so that won't cause overfitting yes that i am trying to think if i like phrase that argument correctly yes so what do you like uh, care about is whatever processing you are applying should also somewhat be reflected in the test set and what you end up doing by using pre processing is you like trying to make your test set more representative of sorry your train set more representative of the test set so any like any time you try to change your train set you like trying to make your model more accustomed to the test set or you like trying to make it generalize better by like augmenting it using rotations 
color techniques whatever how that answer your question so this was another team from h2 and let's read through the six place solution as well i think for everyone watching live we might go over the time limit by like 10 more minutes so we'll like always i everyone is used to that i don't know why like i keep mentioning that i should just like change the schedule time from 1 hour to 2 hours i don't know all right so here's the six place solution it's yolo v5 medium 6 and small 6 trusting cv and post classification so trusting cv they had split data by video id and calculated f2 score on whole out of folds data and they found something interesting cv shows model is working great when inference resolution is the same as image resolution but lb needs higher resolution to get a score boost track improves score post classification improves score a bit more and using low confidence for inferencing and wbf also gives you a boost this is counter intuitive right like you would normally blend models which have like higher confidence but again you have to like check everything possible and assume that's how you arrive at all of this so their best cv submission with normal uh resolution got them to 0.723 on private and best lb had a worse had like a really bad shake up there is also shane uh, showcased how like higher resolution is better their best cv model post classification uses swin transformer they track using no fear do an ensemble and they have then shared the single model configurations so that's about it i i think nothing stands out really here but uh, this this thing is like this stands out a little bit normally you blend models that are very confident that blended models with low confidence which is interesting or infer with low confidence and then use wbf ensemble this is like somewhat interesting so this was the six place solution that you upon the chart all right so this is the seventh place solution cascade rcnn plus tracking public lb is not all you need the main idea is based on stronger baseline cascade rcnn model design with lots lots of customized features carefully crafted data augmentation and object tracking post procedure this was a single model approach and does not ensemble anything so uh, shawn had asked this question a single model can get you a gold and with like very careful hand crafting it's not even like a very fancy swin transformer or like a very demanding model right i think yeah I, i don't think this is like as demanding compared to other models they say first that split randomly by video ids but then they ended up uh, to select the they use train validation split to select appropriate model okay so no they had used a random split after getting the appropriate model they trained it on the entire data set and the lb was sort of their cv interesting even though the title is slightly different right this is what it sounds like right everyone okay let's read through it again split it with randomly use train test validation split yeah that's what it sounds like so they were relying on public lb as feedback correct me if i'm wrong that's what i understand here the team designed a customized cascade rcnn the majority of the model are listed as following stronger backbone they went from resnet to resnex to res2 net to cb net i only know resnet out of this i also know resnex not these two 
they changed from enhanced fpn to pa fpn and i actually asked this question hey what is this i have no idea so they say as for pa f pa fpn you can look at the implementation and there had also is something known as auto augmentation which also comes from some paper but uh, you might want to read through the comments on this one because there is like a lot of clarification that's happening so they had used this from universe net that's what it's that's where it's coming from the carefully sorry i was right here and then they had customized detection head so they had used a cascade rcnn head and converted into a double head and also changed the lost function so you can see that there's like a lot of manual fine tuning happening here that used weak augmentation and strong augmentation if you don't know the difference between these is like strong augmentation you have to like very carefully apply the values and like experiment a lot finally object tracking as post processing so they had used nor fair i think they mean no fair for tracking okay so they're saying that like the model did not perform well on public lb but they didn't trust it at all i guess it makes sense now all right so they say their implementation of cascade rcnn is built on top of universe net and they did not open source their notebook so they never shared i think the solution code but this was interesting because this was the first time i saw cascade rcnn and sounds like that like very carefully tweak the model to like maximum performance and then ended up with like a very nice shake up to the top okay so everything else is just saying it was uh, they're pointing to universe nets uh, configuration all right let's keep reading and i think that moved up by quite a large number of positions yeah so like this team had jumped up by 1100 positions which is like just crazy right like imagine being 111105 is that what it is yeah and then they like jumped to gold position which is crazy all right um eight place solution is quite short they had annotated the images it sounds like training was video 0 and 1 and validation was the third video so instead of splitting by video id uh, their approach was just using the third video for validation they had used model yolo x small and cascade rcnn with a connext base i think this was the first time i saw connext in this competition and used wbf on top of it some interesting augmentations were used clahe we have already seen earlier and a few other ones and there was motion blur as well and we can see the inference size right here so very simple uh, read if i may and they don't share a lot of details do people use ml flow to track experiments i don't know it was just discussed and the the verdict was screenshot of <laughs> training progress is the best approach that's that's the verdict by ayushman let's try to read the ninth position if we don't go too over time i'll keep reading and i assume like you all can watch it later if you're interested if you're out of time but i'll i'll keep going through this solution as well so it says tile training plus seek nms the pre processing is following uh, tile training split an original image into smaller size smaller tiles which each tile having intersection and there was some stride used for each image he noticed a lot of inconsistent and missing labels so he relabeled to improve the model performance and relabeled with cons- convincing original labels and pseudo labels was helpful for splitting sequences were split into 400 frames of continuous chunks and then allocated to each fold 
the alloc- allocating algorithm is greedy similar to four where do they mention four four is this discussion or like they've already shared this in this competition so they're using this kernel uh posted by them i'm still trying to wrap my head around the full setup so split into 400 frames of continuous chunks then allocate each fold to balance the sum of cots all right so uh, this makes sense so like to make sure the data balance is same they like just reallocating the splits and i was just thinking that it's leaky and they already claim that but he says he thought that to balance the target counts is more important because ensembling models with various performances produce poor predictions when using wpf for data sampling they had used a balance sampler and he has shared the ratio of positive and negative sampling right here the augmentations are heavy distortion mosaic mix up perspective and color shift i think this is the first time i'm seeing perspective transform here i didn't see it earlier and there as well he had used an ellipse mask which firmly reduced box loss training input image was 640 pixels and the model was yolo v5 and it was trained on a tesla t4 which is like a really small gpu right compared to other top things the inference was done on a very large size 2560 pixels the tta and we just discussed this right you would still apply tta so they did as well and this was scaling and transforming the post processing was straight forward clearing out low confident images and near edge boxes so like you ideally wouldn't have the thing of interest near the edge uh, in most images and that's what he's done here and some more details which i think we can skip here so he had also used sequential nms he says sequential nms gave him a fair boost when inferencing with most difficult validation sets on images that were bubbly or blurry so he says this is more robust to background noise on the contrary he says the effect of this is not the same on lb scores it doesn't gain as much all right so this was an interesting read because blizzard blizzard sorry <laughs> blizzard had figured out how to chop an image into smaller sizes and do some interesting training on like a very small gpu and it's like really interesting to see how they still ended up in the top and one thing that stands out is that you sequential nms and also tricks from all of these papers so like his cv setup was also different and the way he's sampling the images is also slightly different so you can see that it was quite a unique solution and any time you see like a unique solution combating against like top solutions with like heavier computation uh, it always uses something like this um let's see I think the tenth place was also fairly straightforward, so I'm going to skip it. I'm just trying to get a feel if I should cover the remaining ones or not. I think we can wrap up here. If I wanted to cover the like top ten solutions, I think we can wrap up around the ninth one. These are the top solutions. The main tricks were figuring out how to post-process uh, tracking. So you need to make sure that like. Uh, through subsequent frames it was tracked well setting up the split was also really key in this competition inferencing on high resolution was another key the image augmentations vary a lot from different team to different team so you can see that those are also interesting a lot of different models were used and a lot of different techniques throughout them were used yolo v5 clearly is the most robust one so yolo v5 makes a really good default at least in competitions but if you're trying to use it at work there's the gpl license you have to like i think buy the license but yolo v5 for any competition is like a great <laughs> default um start with yolo v5 try to apply post processing uh, check out wbf 
use a lot of image augmentation experiment with that a lot i think that's the gist of this uh, competition so these are all the top solutions that i could cover in like an hour and 15 minutes quick reminder uh, study group for this book starts in 10 days and i am doing a quadruple grandmaster panel so all the 4x gms gms and all categories they've kindly agreed to it still scheduling it but it'll happen in a few weeks so just keep an eye out for that i'll keep live streaming top solutions every sunday same time uh, i'm looking forward to learning more with you all hopefully you learn something hopefully you found this helpful and i'll see you all in the next week thanks for watching